Hello, and welcome to the April edition of the Habitat Home Show. Today's show features Norm Maiozzi, our Director of Operations, who will be describing to us the selection process as well as the construction process on our Habitat homes. Our volunteer spotlight today will be with Laura Moore, who is a very dedicated volunteer on a couple committees as well as um, a huge asset to us when it comes to getting in-kind services and labor as well as materials for our job sites. We'll be featuring a couple items in the ReStore again, including uh, this, this month we have all new items actually to feature, brand new, not just gently used. And we'll be looking at the 213 Edison Street and seeing how the progress has been going on with that lately. Additionally, our final segment will be everybody's favorite, Norm's know-how. Well, Norm will be joining me again to talk about some amazing plumbing tips. Uh, and those are his words, actually. So uh, we're going to begin the episode with a short interview with Norm Maiozzi, our Director of Operations. So welcome, Norm. Welcome back to the Habitat Home Show. Thank you, Brad. Yeah. Glad to be here. <laughs> yes, we, we enjoy having you. I think not only your Norm's know-how, but this might be the second or second time I think you've been here in the interview process, or is this your first interview? Uh, first interview. We were oh, part well. of, I think, the initial show, but mm -hmm. yeah, first interview. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Well, tell me, um, today's episode, we want to kind of focus on site selection and construction. Mm -hmm. um, tell me how the site selection works for Habitat. Um, well, what we I have a committee of volunteers that works with me, and um, what we do is we evaluate, of course, empty building lots, okay. um, as well as properties for renovation. Most of the properties that we evaluate, or that we actually look at, are donated properties, many of them just from private owners, uh, but we also have partnerships with some of the municipalities in town, of course, the city of Dayton, as well as uh, uh, city of West Carrollton, the city of Kettering, city of Trotwood. So what happens is they have a property that may be vacant, uh, foreclosed on, abandoned, and then they contact us, and I take the information and get it out to my committee where one of the committee members actually evaluates the property to see if it'll fit, on, fit into our program. Okay. So uh, you mentioned all the municipalities, and those are both in Montgomery and Greene County. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. so once we have those properties as Habitat, how does that fit into the overall Habitat program? How does that benefit the partner family in the end? Um, well, what we do is we try to keep an inventory of properties. And so in the evaluation process, what we do is we look for areas where, of course, uh, you know, we look at the schools, we look at the neighboring properties uh, to make sure that, and look at amenities around, make sure that it's close to shopping, transportation, and that, um, so that when we, when our, one of our families is ready to select a site, we actually can, basically, we give them a book and say, here are the properties that are available. And then from that, they take that and uh, to see what area, you know, fits them best and fits their needs the best. Excellent. Mm -hmm. I guess, so it's giving them the opportunity, like a normal homeowner, mm -hmm. to pick the best site that's available. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So before they buy the house, or since they are buying the house, they can at least choose out of our selection what works best for them then. Right. Excellent. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. What are some of, you mentioned a couple of the criteria. Are there other criteria that you look at for the sites? Um, there are, of course, we have to look at, we have to evaluate the, uh, the, the, any property for renovation, just to make sure that it's structurally sound. Mm -hmm. um, we also have to, of course, be cautious, cautious or, aware, or at least aware of the cost that it would take to renovate. Typically on our renovations, we try to get the, a renovated home as close to a new home, let's say within within reason. So, so normally, what that means is we'll replace heating and air conditioning mm -hmm. uh, equipment as well as plumbing equipment. Nine times out of ten, we're replacing all the plumbing that we can get to. Um, electrical systems are all upgraded and updated. Panel panel service pipe service panels, entrance cables, and that are are redone so that when our family moves into a uh, you know, renovated home, their expenses would be limited to, let's say, hopefully just minor expenses, like anybody moving into one of our new homes. Mm -hmm. um, new properties, of course, we want to make sure that they are um, buildable, 
that they also will our, will accommodate one of our one of our plans. Mm -hmm. um, you know, same kind of thing. Like any any new property, you want to make sure that the the house fits the neighborhood. So we try to look at the surrounding architecture. And one of the common misconceptions, you know, is that our houses kind of look like um, like they're all the same. And anybody who's seen one of our houses lately knows that that's not the case. We, we actually changed the front architecture to make them fit the neighborhoods. Uh, we have, like I say, different elevations for um, different neighborhoods so that when you drive down the street, most people go, that's the Habitat house? Because it does really look great. So. <laughs> well, so how many, uh, it sounds, I know we have a few different models that we kind of base everything off of. Mm -hmm. Different floor plans maybe, I guess. Mm -hmm. How many models do we have? Uh, I think right now we have about nine, okay, so. um, right? And there are three bedroom, four bedroom, five bedroom. And then what we do is based on our um, family selection criteria, um, we then will place, you know, depending on the size of the family, we determine which three bedroom might fit better in certain neighborhoods or four bedroom or five bedroom if necessary. Gotcha. And are they all one story or certain, uh, there's certain restrictions or not necessarily restrictions, but parameters that you have to work with, do they become two-story at some point? They do. Matter of fact, yeah, we, we have two-story plans in some areas of town, especially when we go into neighborhoods like uh, one that we're building in West Carrollton or some areas, of course, of Montgomery County. If all the neighboring houses are two stories, we're going to build a two-story in there. And same, sure. same thing, it works in reverse. If they're all single stories, we're not going to put a two-story home in a in an area like that because same thing, we want the houses to complement and enhance the neighborhood, you know, rather than be the one that they, you know, that doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that ties in, can you tell me about how the house is priced for the partner family then as it sits in the neighborhood? So once it's built, mm -hmm. um, how, do, how do we assign the value to it, to okay. them? For the mortgage, I guess, would be the more particular part. All right, well, just like any other new home purchase, we have a private appraisal done on the property. Mm -hmm. um, of course, they, what they do is they evaluate it based on the uh, comparable um, home values and home sales in the neighborhood. Um, you know, our goal is to actually um, to increase the value of the neighborhood or the surrounding properties. Uh, we, we build Energy Star certified homes they're really built well. We use two by six exterior walls, all kinds of high efficient equipment inside. And so typically, like I say, that's what we actually see as our homes appraise um, for probably um, many times on the higher end of the surrounding, you know, surrounding properties. Cool. So, and you mentioned the energy efficiency. How does that benefit the partner families as they pay off their mortgage, as they, as they grow into their house? Sure. Um, so the benefit is, is that our homes, which again, we certify them. We actually have a rater come out and do testing on the house. And typically the ones we're building right now are anywhere from, let's say 35 to about 48% more efficient than a, the average new home that's built today. Mm -hmm. um, what that translates to is that their energy bills, so Vectrin or DPNL, um, are usually about 40, 30 to 40 percent less than a comparable new house, which is really about a 50 percent savings probably compared to the neighbors around them. Mm -hmm. So more, you know, more disposable income. Our goal is to, of course, make it more affordable for the families because uh, we want our families to succeed, mm -hmm. you know, and prosper. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's another piece or it's one way the construction uh, helps reverse the cycle of poverty for our partner families, huh? Sure. Yeah. Okay. And thinking of the construction, um, you know, volunteers do this. How does that work? You know, yeah. I think a lot of people, when I talk to them, they're like, I, you know, I don't know how to build anything. I can't probably volunteer. How does that work on the job site? Okay. So, so one of the things we say is we don't care what kind of experience um, our volunteers have. As long as they come out willing to work, we want them to go home tired and dirty. Um, <laughs> The way it works is I have uh, very experienced site leaders that are out on the job site um, every day and they know how to do just about anything that's out there. So when we have a volunteer that doesn't know, like I say, which side of the hammer to use, or of course it's more complicated than that, but, but we are um, 
happy to teach. We have all the tools that are needed, um, all the safety equipment that's needed so that, you know, when the job is done, we are making, my guys are making sure that the house is, that it's done properly. And like I said, I'm very proud of the, of the homes that we do build. Like I said, I, I would stack them against any commercial builder out there. And I don't think anybody could say that that one was done by a volunteer and that this one was, uh, was done by um, subcontractors. As a matter of fact, I think the volunteers do a better job because they want to do it right. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that's a, that's a benefit that we have. And they'll put some extra nails into the they'll put extra, framing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's sure right. That that's right. They're not concerned about how long it takes. They just <laughs> want to do it right. So it's a good thing. Now, volunteers can't do everything. And that's kind of mandated um, by the municipalities or at least our region in some ways. Uh, what contracted services do you have? So we contract out what I call, uh, well, of course, our mechanical systems. So plumbing, electrical, and heating systems mm -hmm. are done by a licensed contractor. And, you know, that's, of course, for the benefit of our families, as well as, of course, municipal many municipalities require that, that you know, where we build. Um, also, what I call uh, critical um, parts of construction. So our foundations, we actually contract those out. We want to make sure that they are level, plumb, square, and that the foundation, of course, that's what you build your house from. We want that done right. Um, and then some other things we typically contract out would be the um, drywall finishing. Mm -hmm. It's just one of those where if you've ever done drywall work, um, you know, you could have three days of people knowing what they're doing and then one day of people that are just learning and it takes you three more days to correct that one day. So <laughs> we've tough. decided that yeah, we want the, we want the, you know, the house to look great. Mm -hmm. So we contract that out. The, the majority of the rest of it we can do with volunteers. Excellent. So, mm -hmm. so that also provides another way, and this is me being biased as the development person, for people to get involved, right? Or donate to Habitat. Sure. And, so if you're a licensed electrician, HVAC, plumber, uh, or you do drywall finishing or concrete work, we can actually accept donations of services and labor and materials in those, in those realms for it, correct? Yeah, absolutely, and that's, and that's a huge part mm -hmm. of how we do what we do. You know, we have many um, different contractors um, who will offer up their services, their time, sometimes even materials that they have. You know, sometimes um, if you imagine other contractors may have uh, bought a house full of, let's just say light fixtures that somebody changed their mind on and they have basically, they're just sitting there. Well, you know, we're a perfect recipient for that. We, of course, you know, it really benefits us because that allows our development department to take funding um, from this job and move it somewhere else so that we can hopefully serve another family or more families and yeah it's a good thing yeah. we're always looking for donations <laughs> of course yeah. so if you would like to donate services material uh, or labor of any sorts uh, please contact us via our website at www.daytonhabitat.org or give us a call at 937-586-0860 well thank you very much norm we appreciate you being here and telling us a little bit more sure. about the construction and how how you find the spaces or the lots to construct in. So thank you very much for your time this afternoon. All right, thanks for having me, Brad. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Next up, we're going to speak with Laura Moore and we'll have our volunteer coordinator, Ashley Reeves, interviewing her. Good afternoon and welcome to our April edition of the Volunteer Spotlight. My name is Ashley Reeves and I'm the Volunteer Services Coordinator and today I am joined by Laura Moore. So thank you for being here today. You are one of our previous board members, a current member of our Field Operations Committee. Uh, so thank you so much for being here today. No problem, Ashley. We appreciate you being here with us. Uh, today we're actually going to be focusing on your current project, which is our 2016 Women Build. Uh, something that we um, have vamped up again for this year. So uh, first off, tell us what Women Build is. Ashley, Women Build is a project that started back in 1991 with a group of women from Charlotte, North Carolina, and Habitat International approved the Women Build project probably in 1998, and so it opened it up to all affiliates. And so our affiliates started the program, I believe, back in 2000. Okay. And I came on board in 2001 with the Women Build project. But it basically empowers women, volunteers, to teach them how to build houses, you know, and to to know that they can be on the site and not feel inadequate because there's a lot of women who don't have all the skill sets in construction, but they can feel like they can be part of something. And it's really rewarding. 
it's a great experience. It's something they'll never forget. Even if they're just there for four hours, mm -hmm. it, it's just amazing what women can do, you know, out on the job site. Absolutely. I know when I'm out in the community, that's something I get a lot of buzz about. A lot of women come up to me and they're very passionate about that. They're really excited mm -hmm. about something like that, that they have the opportunity to to come onto site and, and work alongside women and work uh, towards a home for a single mother and her children. So, um, but what kind of, when you, so you've been with Women Build since 2001, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of drew you to the Women Build initiative? Well, um, I was approached by a board member back back in 2001, Charles Sims and his wife Ann Sims, who started the first Women Build here in the area. And they wanted another woman to chair the thing. And so they approached me and I was kind of hesitant because I've never been involved with Habitat. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I didn't think I could, I didn't have the hands-on construction skills, so I'm thinking, I don't know what I can participate in this. But I said, I'll give it a try. So I went to a construction site one day, and I was amazed because they showed me how to use power tools and how to properly use a hammer, you know, hammer or nail. And I was really, it was really empowering to know that, wow, you know, I can really do this. And so then I realized that it didn't matter, you know, what age you were, what skill set you had, that any woman could work on a job site because there are so many different as aspects of building a house that, you know, we need people, you know, to put walls up, but to put, you know, windows in or even just painting or sanding drywall, caulking. I mean, there's things for everybody to do. And that's what amazed me that, you know, a group of women could change a community and, you know, and they could feel accomplished. I know on my first house afterwards, you know, I said, told everybody, all the women, turn around and look what you've done, you know. You, you were out of your comfort zone coming in here, and now look what you have accomplished. So it's, it's really amazing. It's really, it, that's what I guess brings me doing this every year is because I see what we can do, and I see the families that we serve. They are so happy when we're there, and they're, they're out there with us, along with us learning it too. And you know, we know that we're building decent, affordable housing for these families. You know, we're, we're addressing the issues, us women, you know. Absolutely. And that's what's really, really neat about the project. I agree. I, it's completely empowering, inspiring for women mm -hmm. to really get out there and, and feel that they can work on a specific project and, and be able, I think that's the greatest part about our volunteer um, program is that we do have those build site leaders that are out there to help instruct and they're so willing to teach and to, you know, step-by-step -step instructions for all of our volunteers mm -hmm. so that they feel comfortable and they feel accomplished for the day on what they were able to, you know, what project they were able to finish for the day. So I think that that is really great. And I know that that happens in Women Build as well. So mm -hmm. that is wonderful. Um, so back to a little bit back to Women Build. Um, are there any specific goals for the Women Build initiative that are different from our um, other build sites, other well, initiatives? Well, the main one with both initiatives, it's, it's getting volunteers. But we would like to stress to getting, you know, all women mm -hmm. to, to volunteer on the build, you know. We'll never have 100% women, but you know, we'd like to strive for 50 or 60 percent, you know, because it is a commodity between women. And, you know, like I said, there's, we need awareness out there too, because like with myself, I wasn't aware of what can be done through Habitat. And if I wasn't mm -hmm. approached, you know, I, maybe I still wouldn't be involved. So I like to get the awareness out, market it more that, women, that we do need women, just not on this bill, but on all bills. And then, of course, um, with us, we would like to get women-owned businesses to participate on the build and to fund the project because we're constantly trying to keep our funding going so that we could continue to do a women build project every year that's that's our goal that this project will go on because you know through national they have their national build week for women build which is okay. always centers around mother's day okay so and again we will be doing ours around mother's day this year absolutely so. i know uh, may 6th and 7th is our kickoff day uh, so we're looking for women to come out and help out at the Women Build kickoff. Uh, so can you tell me a little bit about the family uh, that the 2016 Women Build homeowner for this year? Yeah, um, her name's Kimberly Shepard, and she has three children. Okay. And she's, she's worked very hard, and I know she, that she's done everything she can in the program, which is doing classes and her hours on the site, mm -hmm. on different sites. But she's, she's, um, she's worked very hard, and she also, you know, wants to be in this new area because where she lives now it's a high crime and drug activity so her children she you know she she wants to have safety for her children absolutely they have to walk to school you know you don't know what's in that environment and you know these kids you know they can't do any extracurricular activities in their school system so she's looking forward for them going to a new school and they can do sports 
and she can, you know, if she needs to leave them alone right after school, she's, she's going to feel safe that they're going to be in a good neighborhood. I really want to thank you for coming out and speaking with us today and being our volunteer spotlight for April. Uh, you do amazing work with us for Habitat, so we appreciate everything that you do with us, Laura. Well, thank you, Ashley. So now we'll take you back on an update for our 213 Edison Street build. Uh, that is located in Dayton, Ohio, and it is being built for Remedios Lopez, who is a single mother of six children, who will be uh, signing the mortgage, we expect, sometime in June. Uh, we believe it'll be done in that uh, in by the beginning of the summer. So as you can see with the clips that are rolling now, we have exterior work wrapping up. The front and the back of the house have been sided. The roofing's done. Um, all the blue board and the insulation on the exterior is set up. Um, they're actually, volunteers are currently working on building the garage, which is something that uh, we don't have on every, every Habitat house. It it's kind of goes back to what Norm was saying about what the neighborhood looks like and the feel and the look of the neighborhood, um, as well as the windows have been installed for this house. Um, if we go to the inside of the house in these next pictures, we have the interior mechanicals are close to being finished. There's a couple things to wrap up there. And once they're finished, uh, they'll be inspected, and then we will be able to hang the drywall, finish the, uh, the drywall, and put all the paint and everything together. So we're very close to wrapping this house up, uh, literally, in the exterior part, and then also figuratively inside as we finish up the drywall and all the interior work. It's great to see that the Edison Street build is going so well. Next up, we're going to do Norm's know-how with Norm Miozzi again. He's gonna give us some plumbing tips, some easy fixes you can do at home. So welcome back, Norm. Thank you, Brad. What do you got for us today? Well, today I decided to talk about, um, as you mentioned, plumbing. And one of the things that happens is sometimes at, at your home, you get a plumbing leak. Um, I know one of the things I've experienced before is you get a plumbing leak that needs to be fixed as quickly as possible. Um, so the traditional way to fix it would be, you know, you cut the pipe, you put in a connection like this in between the two pieces of pipe. You get out your handy plumbing torch. Of course, there'd be a propane or something, butane attached to this. But um, basically, you get out your torch, you get out some flux, you get out some soldering uh, wire, and then actually you sit there and you heat it up and you try to get it to, try to, get it to solder and make the fix. Um, I'm gonna show you something that they've come out with that, that really makes the job simple and they're called push fittings. Uh, there's a brand that's called Shark Bite, but there's a number of different ones. You can get them at, the, uh, at Home Depot or at Lowe's or any hardware store. And the beauty of these is anytime you try to fix a plumbing pipe there's, where there's water in it, water makes it hard to solder. And, it, and at, least, at least with um, every time I try to do it, it's always the spot that takes about an hour or so to drain the water of, out of. There's a couple different things plumbers have tricks to do that, but if there's water in that line, you'll never get a good solder joint. So the push fittings, this is, this is one of them, all right? And they're actually made depending on the size of the copper that you're going to repair, all right? They're made to fit the copper. The beauty of them is with this one, like I say, you put it together, you put your two pipe ends together, you have to clean this really well, you have to get it hot enough, you have to make sure there's no water in it, it won't work. Hmm. All right, with the you have push, to turn the water off too, Turn right? the water off, of course. Yeah. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> I always forget about turn the water off, turn the power <laughs> off. But you do have to turn the water off. But with, the, with this kind of a fitting, it doesn't matter if there's water in it, it doesn't matter if there's water dripping, it doesn't matter, it really doesn't matter at all. You literally just take the fitting, put it in here, push, push the fitting in, and then once you get the, foot, the fitting into place, it will not come out. Really? There are inside the fitting are so is basically like a washer that's barbed, and then once you put this into place, same thing. You shove that in there. That is a permanent guarantee or permanent leakless, leak-free joint, and you're done. Wow! Turn the water back on, and you're ready to go. They make these fittings for uh, actually. They're actually already installed on hose bibs, because a lot of times people let their hose bibs freeze. All you really do is you just cut off the old one, you make sure you have the right length, push it on, and it's done. I'm telling you, this is the greatest thing in the world. They also uh, make uh, these push fittings 
uh, for things like with shutoff valves mm -hmm. already attached to them. So underneath your sink, if your shutoff valve is bad, you just can cut your copper, um, push it on there, and you've got a new shutoff valve that's already ready to go. And your shutoff valve is what you do, let's say you're not on one of those. That's what you use to turn off the water that's going through that pipe. Correct. If you're going to do something. And usually that can be found at what, your hot water heater, if it's a hot side. Water heaters, underneath sinks, behind mm -hmm. toilets, you know, there's all kinds of things. Now the push fittings like this are made for to work with copper mm -hmm. and it's actually the only thing it doesn't work with is what they call a soft copper or flexible copper. But MK or L copper these work with. Um, they also work with what they call uh, PV CPVC piping okay. as well as PEX and those are the new plastic wow. pipes and it's really the same fitting. This same fitting will work with any of those three types of pipes. So That's cool. It's a great easy quick fix if you ever have a leak you just cut that bad part out and squish them back together and that's it, you're done. Specific instructions are on the, on the packages, but they're really easy to work with. Excellent. Well, cool, thank you so much. You're gonna make many of us, I'm sure, look like plumbing geniuses in the future and probably save us some money versus nothing against the great plumbers that work in the area, but we can replace some of these things ourselves, right? So, I mean, if you have any other tips you would like to see Norm address and Norm's know-how, Please email Norm at normsknowhow at daytonhabitat.org, uh, which I think is up on your screen now. So thank you again, Norm, for sharing this tip with us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next month. Sure. Thank you, Brad. Awesome. This month's Restore Focus, we get to actually showcase some of the brand new items we have. So please visit us at 115 West Riverview Avenue in Dayton, Ohio. Um, if you're interested in donating your gently used or new items, please feel free to call 937-222-2296 or you can now go online to our website at www.daytonhabitat.org backslash restore and sign up to have us come pick up your donation. You can schedule it all online so we wanted to make it very easy for you. But this month we're looking at some new bathtubs that we were able to acquire through a donation from Marksent Labs and Lowe's. Um, as well as we have some brand new KitchenAid and Gen Air appliances, some great refrigerators, um, kind of wine beverage coolers, as well as some other knickknacks for your kitchen. Um, the other thing we're looking at this month are we have a great partnership with Morris Home Furnishing. And just this past Friday, we got about 35 pieces of brand new furniture that Morris Home Furnishings was able to donate to us. So we have uh, various chairs, some recliners, some even electric recliners, as well as various uh, furnishing or various couches, a wide variety of colors and styles for your couches. And then we have a few sectionals, as the one showed here, that were donated. So we, we very much so value our partnerships in the community with places and organizations such as Markson and Morris Home Furnishings. Thinking of the ReStore, We'd like to thank you for joining us today in this April edition of the Habitat Home Show. And we want you to get excited about our next month's edition where we'll be actually following the truck. So if you go online and schedule a donation pickup, you'll kind of see what it looks like from the ReStore's perspective, how they go out, pick up uh, the donations made online and bring them back to our ReStore in order to be sold to support the builds in the community. So thank you again for joining us and we'll see you next month.